All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the last Sunday of February. Seems like it was just Christmas, like last week. Um, February 28th, 2021. This is the final Sunday school class with the book that we've been studying all year by John C. Lennox, 2084 Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. This is a chapter entitled The Time of the End, and I will preview for you that our um, our discussion question is really just kind of be summative about some of the things that we've learned or that we've been encouraged to think about as a result of, of our study this, this week, or not this week, this, this year so far. <clears throat> I'm going to read from Philippians 2, uh, starting with verse 5, and I'll read the NIV and the message version. So if you want to get your Bible ready for that, those will be our verses for today. So um, we are not actually going to do a check-in today. Um, and we'll do joys and concerns at the end, uh, but this is our, our lineup, um, and uh, we've got a very exciting announcement, actually, that I had not heard of before I saw the announcements that Blair <clears throat> emailed out to our those of us that are teaching, teaching online, um, so mm -hmm. uh, hopefully this will not inspire too much envy, um, but anyway, I'm looking forward to us gathering together again, and I cooked a brisket last night. And I promise you that if we want, I won't, if, if we just, if everyone votes to have a vegetarian potluck, then I suppose we can do that. But I am really looking forward to us gathering together again uh, in person, but we don't know when that is. My parents this last week, um, my mom said, we want to come to Oklahoma in May and we want a brisket. <laughs> and I said, Okay, that's that's great. Um, so as vaccines are dispersed or dispensed, and you know, um, as we go go further forward in this time, I know that we are contemplating um, how how things are going to change. And so, one of the things that I want to encourage us to pray for today is just wisdom, as we are probably all ready to be done with this pandemic, but yet it is not over yet. And I, I think it is a good idea for us to follow advice of uh, our leaders uh, when it comes to safety and, and all those kinds of things. And so anyway, um, that's, my, that's my thought. So let me, let me open us up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us again to gather in your name. I thank you for Professor Lennox and the work that he did on this book and the commitment of not only uh, Professor Lennox, but many others to, um, you know, provide materials and uh, books and study that encourage us to go deeper in our reading of the Bible and in our relationship with you, God. And so as we wrap up this book study uh, and look forward to our next topics of conversation, Lord, I just pray that you would be in the midst of our conversations. I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts to your Holy Spirit. We invite your Holy Spirit to join us in this time. Um, and I thank you for each person who is here and for our church. And I pray that you would help us to be responsive to your call this day and in the week to come. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so announcements. Uh, the gathering is continuing. Um, Frito chili pie. If you're motivated by food, I don't have a picture of that, but anyway, that's going to be that is continuing. Um, and then the um, the church is is also continuing to encourage the formation of micro groups. And uh, the new sermon series, which starts today, is called Teach Us to Pray, that is walking through the Lord's Prayer. And the church is continuing to share resources um, for those who would like to um, be, be in these micro groups. And so that Lenten devotional book is available uh, in print uh, or online. And we're encouraged to, to join a group. Um, and if that is something that is of interest, um, I'm sure that if you contact the church office, um, and, and maybe there's some of us, I don't know if anybody is involved in one, but we could certainly share that if, if any of you are involved and want to have additional members but that encouragement of small groups is so important. And it's something that as I've, you know, learned about different churches, life church, um, you know, especially when you hear about really fast growing, you know, non-denominational Christian churches, 
a common denominator that I seem to always observe is a focus on small groups where it's not just about gathering, you know, in, in, in large groups on Sunday, but it's also about small groups. Um, the exciting announcement here that I hadn't heard of before, I'm glad they're, they're promoting men's group. So yay, men's group continuing to meet on Friday mornings. And I think that probably here in March, we will have a return to face-to-face. -to -face. The leadership team hadn't decided for sure about that, but we've been talking about that. So we've been in a, an online only mode for a couple months or maybe it's since December. And so anyway, uh, that's good to see. But look at this, Pastor Eric is going to be teaching an eight week class on Wednesday nights and it's gonna start on March 10th and it is available both online and in person. And as we've heard him mention in his sermons from time to time, his graduate work at Princeton focused on the civil rights movement. And so he's going to be sharing out of that study and um, out of his continuing interest. And the, 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 the series is called The Biblical Roots of the Civil Rights Movement. And it's going to be every other week. So it's gonna start on March 10th and then it's gonna go through May 12th. They're asking for a $10 donation uh, for the book of readings. And uh, like I said, it's gonna be online and, and in person. So we have been talking and I don't know what we're gonna decide, like at what point we're ready to, uh, to go back in person. Probably that's going to be after our second vaccine shots for sure, you know, after we've had that time. I mean, we're at school every every day, basically. Um, but anyway, I'm glad the church is continuing to offer those options, and I'm personally really excited about that because um, we have so much important work to do together on so many different issues and topics, and certainly the issue of race relations and um, promoting understanding and, and coming together under the banner of Jesus, um, you know, is not just something that's uh, theoretical and, uh, you know, something to think about, it's something to do. And so I, I expect, because I've talked to Eric and some others that we're going to have some other opportunities here ecumenically to connect with some other congregations and to do some some work here, here in our community um, that's going to involve some bridges hopefully being built relationally between our congregation at FPCE um, and, and some other congregations here in the metro area that are predominantly African-American. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I do have a link, I've included this before in our slides, to the Linton handbook or the Linton study devotional book. And so you can find that. I emailed everybody the um, link to these slides. And if you, have any, if you ever have any questions to any of this, feel free to always reply to those emails because I'll directly get those. Uh, when I log into our church's um, website. And anyway, just feel free. And, and certainly this is not a link anybody wants to type. You want to use your phone to scan that or you want to click, click the link to get that. Um, our next study, I am excited to announce, um, will actually not be a C.S. Lewis book, as I had thought about. I'm, I'm still contemplating perhaps for next year uh, doing Mere Christianity, but maybe starting that in the fall. But Tim Keller, um, and have any of you read a Tim, a Tim Keller book before, or has anybody read this book, The Reason for God? Um, I have not. And it is, um, Tim Keller is, a, is the founding pastor of a really, really large Presbyterian church in Manhattan, New York. He started it in 1989. And so this is one of, of several books that he's written. And this is called The Reason for God, Belief in an Age of Skepticism. So this book was very much written as a response to quote the new atheists. And I think it is going to be a real equipping study for us as we take a look at um, the reasons we have uh, the faith that we do in, in the New Testament accounts of Jesus and in, in the Bible. Um, and the reasons why, as um, you know, intelligent and and uh, rational people, you know, we we have this claim and this belief that you know Jesus Christ was and is the Son of God, and He was bodily resurrected from the dead, and He lives today in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, and He's going to return again to rule this world, which we've been talking about end times and stuff like that. Those are radical supernatural claims. And there are a lot of folks in the world who really dismiss anything that 
would be called unscientific or you know supernatural. So I'm excited about this. Um, I'll put the link to the video in the slides. I didn't do that, but I did email it to you. I found Tim Keller. I've heard of him before and, and heard him referenced other times, but I went back to the Veritas Forum, which is the place where I discovered John C. Lennox. And there's many other scholars and academics and you know, scientists and others who share their faith. Um, I found that on uh, their website. And so they have about an hour and a half interview with him back in 2011 after he had published this book, really kind of explaining uh, a lot of the reasons for why he uh, wrote the book and then responding to some really, you know, pointed and important questions. And so I also think that it's, you know, we don't have to just study Presbyterians and I don't, that I actually don't know what denomination John Lennox is, um, but it's also, I think, um, uh, good that, that uh, Tim is coming from our Presbyterian tradition. So we'll look forward to that. And that book is, if you want to get it on Amazon, it is $5 in Kindle form, but you can get a print, you know, version of it as well. And as usual, you won't have, you know, you don't have to get the book, but if you want to read it and read along, I think that'll enhance your study and our, and our studies together in our conversations. So here is the big question today. What have we learned basically from the whole year? Um, what has John Lennox taught us? I'm going to share with you uh, a series of quotations and ideas from this final chapter, but um, I will of course pause the recording at that point, but that's kind of what I wanna center our table talk around is what have we learned? What are the things that we've thought about because of this study? Um, what are, the, what are the things that God has put on our heart as a result of our time together and the conversations that we've had? So let's open up the Bible. We're going to read Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. And I do want to read this from both the NIV and the message. So um, let's hear these words from the Apostle Paul writing to the early church at Philippi, starting in verse 5. He writes, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so that was the NIV version. And before I read the message, and I want to uh, encourage you to just pay attention to anything that might stand out um, from, from either version, or especially as we contrast Eugene Peterson's more contemporary language with the, the NIV. <clears throat> this is a verse that, that Linux uses in chapter 13, and, and this is a really important point, and he, he talks about how, you know, biblical prophecy, and this isn't just prophecy for the future, but like his, biblical history too. Human beings have screwed up when we become arrogant, when we put ourselves on the throne, and when we elevate ourselves and think that we're all that and we can, we can be God. And we've talked a lot in our class about this book by Yuval Harari called Homo Deus, which means, you know, man as God. Um, and so really the reminder that Linux has in, in sharing this is, that just as we see from the example of Jesus, it is so important for us to remember humility and that as we develop our capacities with science and with technology or with money or whatever kinds of things we, we have as human beings to make sure that our mindset is the same as Christ, that we strive to have the mindset of Christ, which is a mindset of humility, which is a mindset of service and servanthood, which is not an attitude or mindset of arrogance or, um, you know, certainly not belittling others, but just not, not holding ourselves up to saying, you know, we got this all figured out and we, we know the answers. Um, the other thing I, well, and, and we'll see what kind of things stand out for you all, but <laughs> the claims that Paul is making here, which are central to Christianity, 
which is that the name of Jesus is the name above every name, and that ultimately in the history of our planet, we will have a time when all people will will have the opportunity to to choose Jesus or not and to proclaim his name. You know, there are not multiple equal ways to salvation and eternal life. We understand as Christians that, you know, either Jesus is who he says he was or or he's not. And 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 Jesus's claims are that he is the son of God and that he is the unique way. He is the gate. So anyway, that's just something else I'm thinking about. And that'll tie in with, with things that we'll talk about with Tim Keller in the upcoming week. So here's the message version, the same verses, Philippians 2, chapters 5 through 8. But as Peterson usually does, he groups these through in a, in a section, in a paragraph for sections for verses 5 through 8 and then verses 9 through 11. Here's how Peterson phrases the same biblical text. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to pause the recording. There we go. Okay. All right. So let's talk about a little bit of quotations from the book. And then uh, then we'll actually go into two breakout rooms. So it's always maybe a little bit easier when we're, when we're in smaller groups to, to share. So we'll do that. And then we'll have some time at the end to come together, I think. The final chapter, the time of the end. Um, if you're interested, I'm not going to be going through all 16 of my, my highlights, but I, I have made a little album, if you're interested. Uh, I really do love reading on my Kindle. And so as I highlight uh, the chapters, then I'll, some, I'll take screenshots of those and I put some of those into our lesson. So anyway, I'll have probably about five or six of these in here, but if you want to see all those, uh, you can actually visit that link. Um, here's the first one. This is just from the, the first the first uh, paragraph of the chapter. I superimposed on here, but he's got it written in the first sentence. The verses that we were really, we, we took two different weeks. We, we interrupted that to talk about the Mars lander and space, but Daniel 7, that which, which we learned, we heard was sort of the hinge verse of the book of Daniel in terms of looking at his, at, at his prayer, his dream and his his prophecy his his vision that he had of the end times paul's letter to the thessalonians second thessalonians especially chapter 2 and then you know the book of revelation but specifically chapters 12 13 and 17 um linux helps us understand that the prophecies and the end time visions of these books both old and new testament are the same. This man of lawlessness that uh, is how Paul talks about in Second Thessalonians is the beast, uh, the fourth beast actually in Revelation, um, and, and, and that there's this world government of hideous strength overtly and maximally hostile toward God uh, that is foretold. Um, and another thing that's kind of been thrown in here, and I haven't said a lot about this, but when I was in college, I, we actually had a philosophy class that we had to take at the Air Force Academy, and I enjoyed it a lot. And we did learn about Kantian ethics, which, <clears throat> which you know, 
contrasts most uh, significantly against utilitarianism, the ends justify the means. Kant is an idealist, and he has the categorical imperative, and Kant puts forward a philosophical framework which suggests that because of the conscience that we have in us, we have the capacity for right, to know right and wrong, you know, independent of... Um, independent of religion. Um, and, and so anyway, Kant, and I had not known this until reading Linux's book, <laughs> he, in a, in a, not a, you know, I was told by God and had this in, in a vision, but as, as a philosopher and a student of human psychology and sociology and history says, don't make the mistake of putting all your power and, and, and investing all your authority into a single person, because what that is going to do, what that has done historically and will always do is lead to a, quote, graveyard of freedom. It will lead to oppression. It will not end well. And it's a bad idea. And so this is, it's interesting that, that Linux, you know, crosses several different references to not only biblical and theological um, books and, and writers, but, but also um, more contemporary writers, although Kant was, he lived a while back. Um, we've talked about Yuval Harari, Homo Deus, there's a little screenshot of the book, A Brief History of Tomorrow. Remember, he's an Israeli historian who grew up Jewish, but is an atheist. Um, and one of the biggest points of the latter chapters of this book by Lennox is saying, we've heard this story before. We know how this ends. As we look to the future and we think about technology, let's not elevate ourselves as human beings thinking that we're going to, you know, be able to overcome sin and and, and, and bring about a utopia, um, we're not going to be able to do that ourselves. And we got to be super, super careful, you know, not to try to put too much faith in, in human beings and invest too much power in them. Um, so Paul, um, this is a response that Linux is writing about like, why should, what should we do about this? Okay. So we've read these prophecies and we've read these scriptures. What do we do? And Linux is pointing out that even in first, you know, first century, um, you know, Palestine and and the Holy Land and Asia Minor and the, the the world of Rome, in which Paul was writing, when he wrote to the Thessalonians, he said that it's really important to pay attention to these trends and and to what's happening with uh, power and uh, and authority, because they're not innocent and they can lead to really destructive power. And I think we saw examples of that with Rome. Um, you know, this is something that's been going on since since the beginning of time, since Genesis. <clears throat> but as I highlight there in the middle, but in the Western world, we have lived to see a ramping up of open hostility, not only to God, but also to public expression or pub yeah, public expression of belief in him. And this is where it's also really relevant to remember Daniel and how Daniel was challenged to reject his faith in God and to, you know, recant. Uh, fortunately, I don't think any of us um, have faced that kind of, of persecution in our lives where we've been, you know, threatened with death. If we don't recant our faith, we have so much that we take for granted, you know, living here in the early 21st century in, in the United States of America. Um, but <laughs> there has been a struggle going on, and there is a struggle that continues against the claims of Christianity and even the open practice of our faith. And so paying attention to this and thinking about how we would respond and may need to respond as we are challenged in our faith and our belief, those are really important ideas. Um, I don't know if you recognize this fellow. I have not shown his picture in our class before. Uh, this is Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, you may know that Nietzsche is famous in philosophy for many things, but maybe the most famous is by proclaiming that God is dead. And Nietzsche is sometimes seen as a father of nihilism. Nihilism is the rejection of the idea that anything has meaning. And Nietzsche was in his philosophy um, you know, was, was, a, was an incredibly harsh critic of religion in all forms and Christianity specifically. 
and you know viewed it all as just creations of of um, of human beings. Nothing supernatural was was real, um, and that um, this death of God um, would lead to nihilism and the, the loss of of meaning. Uh, the last little highlight I have there is something that I've, I've, I've not thought about as much as I have in the past month, and that is, what is the biblical map of the future? Um, as I think I mentioned to you, I mean, I've read Revelation several times, and, and we've and have studied it, and, you know, didn't put the pieces together as, as well as I think um, Linux has encouraged us to do, thinking about Old Testament and New Testament scripture, you know, the kingdom of God is going to arrive with the supernatural return of Christ and it's, and to bring about this in, the end of this global tyranny of the beast. That wasn't just Nero in the ancient empire of Rome. Um, that is, a, that, that is the, the biblical map of prophecy for the future. We don't know when that's going to happen, but having the faith that we do in scripture in, in the prophecies which have been fulfilled in the past and those which will be fulfilled in the future, like that's the roadmap. So um, th I think this is significant too. And this is that not all prophecies are, you know, understood by those hearing them at the time. Think about the disciples and how many times we read about how their eyes were not opened. You know, Jesus would say things like the son of man will have to suffer you know, but they were not re recognizing what exactly that meant. It was only, you know, after the fact that 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 the, the impact of that and the truth of that uh, comes to be. Daniel in his in his book of the Bible, um, in Daniel 12, verse 4, expressly says that some of his prophecy will be sealed. And Lennox explains that means it's not going to be completely understood. So there are aspects of this that most likely, almost certainly, we're not going to fully understand until they're fulfilled. But when it does happen, um, we're these these are going to be evident to all people um, talking about the end times and when these things come. So um, a consistent theme throughout scripture is that Jesus is not from this world. The kingdom of Jesus is not an earthly kingdom. It is a supernatural kingdom that is beyond the earth. And that Jesus is coming back. He is going to fully restore his kingdom. Uh, Jesus has come to the earth and he has shown us how to live. And I fully believe that we're called to work to, to bring about God's kingdom here today. Um, but Jesus is ultimately going to be returning, and there's going to be this climactic struggle between, between good and evil. Lennox, in his, in his section titled Conclusion, asks rhetorically, how should we react? You know, what should we do? So what? Does this have any impact to the way that we live our lives, the way that we look at the future? And he points out, you know, even in Daniel, like, it's natural to have anxiety and to, and to have some fear. And that may be things we think about for ourselves or things that we think about for, for our children or for our grandchildren. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this place before. This is not, this is in the, in, uh, the Bhutan. Uh, and this is a monastery up in the mountains. I wanted to find a picture of like, go to the mountains and be secluded and be separated, you know, from the world. And so this is a, this is not a Christian monastery. This is a Tibetan uh, temple, um, a Buddhist temple. But one of the things that, that Lennox points out is that complete retreat and withdrawal from our engagement with the world is, is not Jesus's command. And I misspelled that and said non-Jesus. It's not Jesus's command. Um, Jesus and his disciples and in the Bible, we do, we do not read an exhortation to say, you know, um, hide and withdraw from the world and do not engage. Uh, keep, keep this good news to yourself uh, and just hide. We're called to be engaged in the world and to, and to share the good news. There's a lot of ways that we're called to do different things. And I'm not saying that, that people who have been, you know, monks or nuns or people who have, have um, lived in monasteries are... I'm, I'm not passing judgment upon them, but what I am saying is as a people, <clears throat> we're not called to just retreat and hide. We're called to be engaged in the world. And so this is what, ah, 
didn't mean to go to that. Let's see if I can advance my slide. Um, this is what Linux says about this. Um, talking again about Paul, and I've got my picture of the candle there, thinking about being the light of the world. Um, and of course, remembering that we are not the source of the light. The source of the light is God. It's Jesus who can live inside of us and be shown to the world. He says that Paul's realistic when it comes to evil, but he does not encourage believers to withdraw from the world. In fact, and this is a focus uh, we read Second Thessalonians chapter two, but if you read chapter three, you know that's where he's saying, "Don't be lazy. Don't just be laying around, saying that the the you know end times are here. Get out and do do work, contribute, and let's engage with the world. Let's try to live as model citizens and Christian witnesses. Let's not be frozen by fear. And that AGI again is the acronym for." Um, artificial general intelligence. We talked about that as sort of the metaphor of, you know, the Terminator, you know, the, the, the AI that's here to destroy us. Um, last night uh, with two of my kids, I watched, I had not actually seen this one. Um, it's the, um, the Avengers uh, uh, episode about Ultron. And it's when, I don't know if any, any of you are Avengers fans. I, I know you probably have children or grandchildren who are. It's interesting because Tony Stark, who's sort of the modeled after Elon Musk, but his character, who's Iron Man, uh, tries to create this artificial int super intelligence and it goes bad. And so he ends up creating this Ultron and that's the, the whole movie is fighting, fighting against Ultron. What Linux is saying here is that we should not be frozen by fear. And, and as we see artificial intelligence, and it is already just rapidly advancing and, and, implant, and impacting our lives, um, that shouldn't prevent us from making the contributions that we can. And he says to the positive aspects of narrow AI. So I want to take you down a quick little rabbit hole here um, about this woman, Rosalind Picard. Um, she is somebody who I am 90% 90, 90 sure of, I have seen her um, on the, the Veritas forum as well, talking about her work. Um, she, and what he quotes her as saying is, we've decided it's more about building, a, this is talking about AI and responding, building a better human machine combination than it is about building a machine where we will be lucky if it wants us around as a household pet. In other words, there are ways that we can, and, and scientists and engineers are today using artificial intelligence to really make dramatic improvements to the world, rather than saying, oh, we're going to ban it all, we're going to stop it all, we've just, we've got to quit because this is all going to end poorly. There is important work that we can do as ethical scientists, engineers, and citizens. So, if you will, I'm going to invite you to join me down a quick rabbit hole. And what do I mean by a quick rabbit hole? Well, we just heard this name, Rosalind Picard. One of the amazing things about the day in which we live is we live in this seek and find world, right? So if you hear the name of a person and like, you know, they've done, you heard that they did a TED talk or something, then you can just Google their name and TED talk or video and quickly be connected to them and their work. So this is the Twitter profile of Rosalind Picard. It says she's a scientist, inventor, and a professor at MIT in the Media Lab. Her interests are artificial intelligence, emotion, and using wearables data for health, epilepsy, and autism. And she's co-founded two companies, which I'm gonna show you a little bit about them, Empatica and Affectiva, all right? And she's, she's active on Twitter. She's sharing ideas and links and things like that here. In fact, the pinned tweet, which means the one that she has at the top of her channel that she wants everybody to see who comes and visits her, is this one with a picture of Dr. Martin Luther King. And she wrote, this is on January 18th, 2021, through our scientific and technological genius, we have made of this world a neighborhood, and yet we have not had the ethical commitment to make it a brotherhood. But somehow and in some way, we have got to do this. And she's quoting Dr. King from 1959 in a, a book that he wrote, or I don't know, it's either, I don't know if this is a book or a speech, but it was called Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution. If you click on the companies in her channel, or her bio, I guess, that she says, uh, here's what you learn about them. Um, the first one is called Empatica. 
And the description is medical wearables and AI that empower thousands of patients, clinicians, and researchers with real-time human insight. And the pinned tweet for Empatica is from last year, from November 9th. And it says, we're thrilled to announce we've been selected by the U.S. Army Medical Research and Development Command to deploy a wearable and algorithm to enable the early and pre-symptomatic detection of COVID-19. So that's an example of the work that they're doing with AI and emotion. Um, the other company, which he has founded, is called Affectiva, and its subtitle says, we are pioneers in emotion recognition software built on sci a, a science platform using deep learning and the world's largest emotion database. Now, I don't have this in the slides, <clears throat> and I don't know if you've heard this, but one of the controversial things that has happened during the pandemic is there's a company called Proctorio. In fact, our daughter has, at UCO, who is, who is a sophomore, has been subjected to this where if when you take tests online, if your eyes move away from the screen too many times, if you're away from your screen, your facial features, all of those things are analyzed and you can actually lose credit um, you know, and, and, and have your grade impacted in the ways that the, these AI tools are being used. That company has been sued by students and is in quite a bit of trouble. That company is actually made legal threats against students who have spoken out against it. The use of artificial intelligence, facial recognition, and, and looking at human emotion, those things are not always used, in my opinion, for good. And I think that's an example where it's being used in very coercive and harmful ways, especially if you happen to be um, a historically underrepresented um, from an, a historically unrepresented ethnic group, um, African-Americans um, and, and other um, minority ethnic groups just haven't been part of the testing of these tools. And so they tend to be much less accurate and therefore um, they, they can actually be more harmful for those kinds of groups. So one of the tweets that's in the Affectiva Twitter stream says tomorrow, and this was back in January, on January 25th, uh, they'll have a panel with, and it has a, the handle, it's Dr. Rana L. Uh, Kilobi, if I'm going to say her name right, name right, and other incredible speakers addressing thorny questions like liability, bias, and the importance of businesses must place on responsible and ethical AI. And so now we're going to click on her name to see who she is, Dr. Rana L. Kalubwoy. She describes herself as an entrepreneur, scientist, co-founder, and CEO of Affectiva, and she's an author of a book, which is called Girl Decoded, on a mission to humanize technology with emotion and AI. And the, the subtitle of her book there at the top is A Scientist's Quest to Reclaim Our Humanity by Bringing Emotional Intelligence to Technology. And so... Um, I'm not going to play a video. I've got it in the slides. And if you want to look at it, you can. Um, but this is a little book trailer uh, for her um, for her book. She is from Egypt. She is a Muslim. Um, and this is just I'll kind of finish the whole little rabbit hole here by saying this. Um, I think this is part of the work that we are called to do. So bringing the passion. Ah, sorry. Trying to not misclick on slides, um, bringing the passion that we have for serving others, for sharing Jesus into the world, which desperately needs the guiding light of Christ reflected in our ethics, values, and our efforts together to improve humankind. Uh, it's really, really inspiring to read about this, this work that's being done. Um, and I'm really thankful for, you know, Professor Lennox for this book that he's written and, and shining the light on this kind of work. And I think that as we have conversations with others about issues and topics that touch on the things that we've been discussing in this class, uh, it's really powerful and helpful um, for us to be pointed to some people like, like these scientists and engineers I've just referenced doing this kind of work, uh, really striving hard to, um, to bring ethics, to bring um, uh, you know, humanizing values to the work, not to, not to do this in, in a vacuum you know, that's not, not influenced by values. So uh, in conclusion, Linux talks about the, 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 the push and the move to superintelligence and a superintelligent homo deus that movement is not going to just naturally and inexorably at a large scale lead back to God or lead to God, 
but the biblical map says it's going to lead to the greatest rejection of God that the world has ever seen. And so what we need to remember amidst this, whether this happens in our lifetimes or the lifetimes of our children or our grandchildren, um, is that you know our calling for how we're to live our life and the, the attitude that we're to have is the same, no matter where we are in the historical timeline. Um, we have to repent of our sins. We have to deal with sin. And we, we understand that, that that's one of the main reasons Jesus came was so that we could deal with our sin and we could entrust our lives uh, to God through Jesus. So this, there ends the prepared little quotations that, that I have in here. Um, what I would like to do now is um, I'm going to uh, put us in, in breakout rooms and invite you to take, um, take about six minutes or so, and that'll give us a little bit of time to come back and, and do a little bit of sharing um, and then also um, do our joys and concerns. What do you think? We've been doing this for a while. Uh, what, are, what are some things that John Lennox has either got you to think about maybe a little more deeply or maybe in a new way, uh, something that he's taught you? Um, what kinds of sort of summary ideas do you have as we are kind of here at the end of this particular book study in our class.